Welcome, Carrie. I am so happy to have you on the show. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Cheryl. Yeah, and I cannot wait to talk about your book. And I devoured it. You have so many nuggets of wisdom in this book. And I wish that I had have had this when my oldest was a tween. And so much of what you share, I've I've learned the hard way. And I know that so many moms that are listening are going to be really helped by what we're going to talk about today. And you also come with lots of experience because you have four girls. So can you just share with our listeners <laughs> their ages and what that's like for you? Yes, they. Uh, you're right. I have four daughters. My oldest is a high school senior. And the book really starts from her journey when she was becoming a teenager at age 13 and the mistakes that I made. But, um, but she's now a high school senior. I also have a 10th grader, an 8th grader, and a 5th grader. So I have a lot of material for my personal life. And like I said, a lot of the mistakes I've made that I like to share with other moms, basically learn from my mistakes and, and do it better. And I also, um, I, write, I wrote this book for moms, but I wrote two prior books for teenage girls. The first one was released in 2014. So that really kind of started me on this path to writing for moms and also writing for teenage daughters and, um, and just really trying to help families build those relationships during what can be some very difficult years. And so what happened was I wrote this book for teenage girls and I traveled around the country and spoke to different groups. And um, I really had a heart for the girls at the times. And I'd have moms that asked me, you know, when are you going to write a book for us? And in my head, I'm thinking never, you know, moms are too, too they're you know, a little bit more set in their ways. I thought it would just be a harder audience, even though I love my mom friends, that just was not on my radar. And then, you know, what parent feels equipped to write a book for other parents? I feel like we're all learning as we go. And and I was thinking maybe 20 years from now, I'll be able to look back and have some wisdom to offer. But what happened was, as my daughters became teenagers, I started struggling myself and I started struggling to find some of the advice that I needed. I also found that you have to be a lot more careful in protecting their privacy in the teenage years. It's, it's not like when they were little and you had trouble with somebody potty training and you could ask pretty much any mom for advice and it's just readily available. And so I just found myself struggling and really wrestling and really going through a, a phase of how do I still parent my child? They're changing. Our relationship is changing as when they become a teenager. How do I still parent them, but also not lose that relationship? Still have a connection and still be that safe place for them. And, you know, it took me a lot of wrong turns and mistakes to kind of find my way. But um, I do, I, I have the privilege of meeting a lot of great moms and just through the work that I do. And so I hear all these stories and things that work for other families. And so I really just wanted a resource where I could share all the wisdom that I've gained from people that I've met over the years. And also, you know, share some of my personal stories of what I've learned as a mom and what's worked in my relationship with my girls. Yeah, well, that's one of the things that I love about your book so much. And I'm so glad that you didn't wait because you're in the trenches and right. you're writing it while you're going through it and what you've learned. And I do think, and I want to talk about that a little bit, that we're really hard on ourselves mm -hmm. and hearing how real and raw you are in the book. We need to hear that rather than like, I'm this expert and I have it all figured out because it is such a journey. And you start out the book talking about how you had that closet floor breakdown, mm -hmm. which I found <laughs> so comforting. And I know when moms, moms get your book, they're gonna be like, oh, thank you, thank you. So will you talk about your closet breakdown? Yes, yes. And, and it's so funny how those moments that are just your rock bottom moments as a mom that you think I will never share with anybody, just what can happen as you grow and become a better mom or a better person and you're ready to actually like share that wound from the past. But um, what happened was I was writing these books for teenage girls and, you know, being called an expert, which I'm, I'm not, but just I consider myself more of a resource. But it was during that time, my daughter became a teenager. She was your typical oldest child. We were very compliant, easy, all of that. And I found our relationship was starting to change. And what happened was over the years, you hear all these things that, you know, teenage girls are such a pain. And I had just these narratives in my head. And so instead of looking at myself and what maybe I could be doing differently, I really let my pride get in the way. And I was blaming it all on her. I was just looking at her emotions and her moodiness and her being difficult. 
And I was like, I got to put an end to this or else she's going to walk all over me. And so I was laying down the law and I was, I was changing too in that relationship. And it was just creating this gulf between us. And we were arguing over stupid stuff that I can't even remember what it was now, but it really kind of built. And I kept thinking, we'll work through it. She's going to start listening to me. It'll get better. So I didn't even tell my husband about it. And um, it was one day, it was right before she went to school. We got in a fight over something stupid and she went to school and I think that God just, I don't know. I think he just opened my eyes to my pride and the fact that I was doing something wrong, that it wasn't all my daughter's fault. And after she went to school, my house was quiet. I just started thinking about what was going on with us and how much I missed her, how cold our relationship felt. And I just, I went in my closet and I just cried. And it was just, I was like, I'm just going to let myself feel this. I'm going to admit what has been bottled up in me for months. And you know, my husband came in there and thought somebody died. He's like, what is wrong? He was working from home that day. And I told him, I was like, I just cannot figure out how to balance parenting her with loving her. Like, this is so hard. Our relationship has changed. I miss the warm, easy connection we used to have, all of this. And so that was really my turning point moment of like, how do you love a teenage girl? How do you love a teenager in general? And, um, and it's funny that now I'm sharing that story because at the time I was thinking, I'm never telling anybody about this. But, you know, but some of the best advice I got that day, I went to the gym and I saw a friend who is ahead of me and often gives me good advice. And I asked her, what do you do when you and your daughter fight? And she goes, you got to circle back around, you know, don't just let it go unaddressed. She goes, you got to circle back around after you've calmed down, go back to her and apologize and ask, you know, is there something I did? Is there something I can do better? So I did that with my daughter later that day, I humbled myself and I asked, I told her, I was like, you know, I'm just sad. I'm sad that our relationship has changed. And she told me that she was sad too. And I asked her, you know, have I done anything, you know, to be causing this gulf that's going on between us? And I honestly expected her to say no. And she told me, yes, (laughs) you know, she, she told me that, you know, you've just been more critical and harder to please lately. And, and that was a punch in the gut, you know, no mom wants to hear that. But at the same time, even as she said it, I knew she was right. I knew that at that, in that season, I was kind of being more critical of myself and she's the oldest child. And so I I think I was also putting higher expectations on her. You're a middle schooler now. I was expecting her to, you know, to rise up to some challenges and I was being harder on her and more critical. So it really just made me do some self-reflection and just work on myself. I apologized. I told her I was going to work on it. And it really did start to turn our relationship around. So I I guess that was when I realized I needed a new strategy. This was not working. And so a lot of what I share in the book is just kind of what has worked in our home. And of course, it's never a perfect process. But the great thing about parenting and kids is that you always can do better. You know, you always can try it again. You know, if you mess up, don't just keep beating yourself up over that. Go apologize you know, learn to work through the conflict and then find a better way to do it. And truly you often can become closer. And and something else I learned through all my research that is that how important conflict resolution is. And I think we really do our girls a disservice because a lot of girls don't know how to resolve conflict. And that's why they end their friendships abruptly or, you know, they give somebody the cold shoulder or the silent treatment and the person doesn't know what's going on. But um, even like America's top couples therapist says the number one predictor of success in marriage is how well two people can resolve conflict. So I started thinking, instead of seeing this as a bad thing, maybe mm-hmm. help teach my daughters how, to, how we can work through this in healthy ways, and it'll help them in other relationships too. Wow. I just love that. That is so true. And mo- many of us growing up didn't learn how to resolve conflict. Right. We were parented in that authoritarian way, lay down the rules and the law and we were just expected to kind of just, you know, uh, buck up and, you know, follow the rules or you were in big trouble. And so I think that's really difficult to know how to do that. And I love how, what your friend said to you and how important repair is, but Mm -hmm. also that you ask your daughter, is there anything that you want to say to me? And, and I, I chuckle. It's like, we don't expect them sometimes to say, you know, oh yeah, you know, this is what you're doing wrong and get that feedback, but you were able to take it in where we can take it so personally and get defensive and feel hurt, which you were able to say, I thank you for telling me, and I'm going to work on this. What would you say? Because that's a real struggle for us as moms not to take it personally and you talk about that 
in the book and they're pulling away and they don't want to be seen with us and <laughs> they're talking back and they're arguing and um, how do you, how have you navigated that? Yes, I think, and that is something I think every parent of a teenager struggles with. And one thing I've learned is when they are, you know, pushing for independence or kind of pushing back, sometimes I ask, well, do I, would I rather than be the other way? Like, I think that that's normal. Like they are, they are learning to form their own identity. They're preparing to live home and live an independent life. Would I rather than mean clinging to me, not wanting to get out in the real world, not wanting to leave home? Like that's not really how it's supposed to be. So really she's on the right road, but how can I navigate this with her? And you're right, we do take it personally. And I think especially as moms, because we're typically the ones who are involved in the details of the daily life. And, um, and we give so much, you know, we pour so much of our heart and soul into our children. And when they're little and they're jumping in our lap and kissing us, it's like, that's enough reward for us. But sometimes with teenagers, we don't get that reward and we are, we're doing the right thing, but we don't feel like it because they're mad or there's a coldness or whatever. One thing I have really learned is that one, I can't find my identity in my children. I can't, I can't base my worth on whether they're liking me today or whether they're nice to me today. I've got to find my value as a child of God and just who I am as a person that's not tied to any of my relationships that I think we, we tend to do that as women. So I've really got to find some confidence that's separate from the relationships I have, that confidence that's not going to change based on my, the relationship changes. Um, and also I've learned the importance of really strengthening our adult relationships during these years. And, you know, I'm, I'm married and, you know, my husband has really become an extra source of support during these years. And also my friendships, I feel like I've had to really turn back to my friends a lot, kind of like I did when my kids were little, I needed them when they were, my kids were small, I needed my mom friends. And then you kind of go through that sweet spot of parenting where you, I almost felt like I didn't need friends because our family was so happy. Things were pretty easy. Everybody was out of diapers. It was just a kind of a, a good spell. And then they get to be teenagers again and it's hard. And I felt like I need people who really understand me and maybe can have some compassion for me, you know, even if my child's not being so nice to me. So I've really felt, I've really found some comfort in those relationships too. Yeah. I love in the book, how you talk about mothering ourselves first and how important that is to, mm -hmm. that's one of the ways we need to have those safe people that we can talk to and we can vent and get it out. And at the same time, what I see, and I don't know if you see this as well, when our kids turn this age, there's a lot of, it's not like, like you mentioned when they're little and you're talking about not getting any sleep or, you know, the toddler twos, it changes. And I see moms have a lot of shame and mm -hmm. they don't want it to get back to their kid if they're talking about their challenges or struggles. And yet to shine the light, you shine the light on that you're struggling and we struggle with these things. And I think it's so important that moms know that because we see social media and everybody looks so happy and then you can feel so alone and you're suffering right. alone. Right. And you talk about the fallout of that if we're not getting that support. Can you talk about that, that if we're not having that safe place to go, what can, what you see can happen? Yes. You know, I'm, I have a big philosophy and I say this because I used to be the type who would struggle alone. I growing up, I was one of those bottlers. If something bottled, you know, bothered me, I'd bottle it up and that's not healthy either. But, um, you know, I just have a big philosophy. Don't struggle alone. And you really have to find your safe people. And I think it differs for every person. Like I said, for some people, it might be their spouse and their closest friends. For other people, it might be a colleague at work might be their therapist, it might be their hairdresser, you know, it might be your mom or your sister. But, you know, a mom ahead of me once told me that as your children get older, your village gets smaller. And I think that's something that's really important for parents to think about is that, you know, when the kids are little, you have these huge play groups, you can relate to a lot of moms, you can share all your stories, it's funny. But as they get older, you've got to protect your teenager's privacy. And it also becomes more important to have I guess, advice in your life with people that have the same values as you do, because the, the gap in parenting really differs as our kids get older. And it really does kind of come out of our, our philosophy comes out of what our values are. So you really want somebody who's kind of on the same page with you. Nobody's 100% the same, but, um, but I do think it's good advice that you don't need 50 people giving you advice. You know, having one or two trusted advisors is enough. And, and even knowing I have certain friends that like, you know, for this child, I might go to this friend for this child, I might go to this friend. 
a lot of times my village is different for each child. It might be, you know, one of their friends' moms that I'm close with, that she knows my child. She loves my child. She can kind of help me. And I know she's a steel vault. She's not going to say anything. You know, I think it's also good to have friends who are out of town. My friend Sue from college, sometimes we'll talk and, you know, it's something I can't really talk about this with my circle because it'll get back to the kids or, or they're, you know, they're involved in this scenario, but it's just good to have somebody who knows you, who, you know, is a good rational thinker, who, um, who loves you most importantly, who, who will reaffirm that you are a great person. You're a great mom and just give you that comfort and encouragement you need. And I really do think we, we have got to do that for ourselves as mothers and to have those kind of friendships, we've got to be that kind of friend to other people too. But we live in a world where we're so busy and we're so child centric. I think sometimes we pour so much time and energy into our children so that when they do, it does disappoint us, we just feel like total failures and we don't have anything else to go to, to help lift our spirits. Um, and so also, you know, just being a woman of faith, I also rely a lot on God and prayer and my faith as well but I truly believe that God gives us people to help us get through those hard times as well. Yes, 100%. We, we need good friends and we need to be able to have that power of prayer and knowing that mm -hmm. God's gonna fill in those gaps, those things that there's so much that we can't control, which I wanna talk about as well. Um, I wanna quote you though, because you were talking about something important regarding you write about blaming ourselves and I find that's one of the the issues that moms often struggle with is we really beat ourselves down when we feel like we're failing and you say quote the truth is a mother's confidence is fragile despite any bravado or outward appearance that we have our act together it takes only one glitch, fight, or failure to trigger our deepest insecurities. Even the most epic high can suddenly come crashing down with one mistake, one argument, one comment we wish to retract. And this is so true. We are so hard on ourselves. What have you done uh, that has helped you to not beat yourself up, to be kinder and more compassionate to yourself? Yes. And this is something I really struggle with. I'm a, I'm a one on the Enneagram. And if somebody's a one too, there, you, we tend to be perfectionists. And I love the Enneagram. I'm a two. <laughs> Are you a, <laughs> a helper? Three, so, but yeah. I can lean sometimes to the one, to the perfectionist. Yeah, for sure. Yes. And so I think if you're that personality too, that you just want to get it right, that it just, we can be so hard on ourselves. And I, and especially in a year like 2020, I think we really learned that this past year, moms did the importance of self-care, self-compassion, self-love. And so sometimes, like I said, I really rely heavily on my faith and I ultimately go back to my identity is not in my motherhood. And that actually, I've just written a new book. And that's the theme of that book is that, you know, you're not just a mom, you're much more than a mom, but you know, that's not my identity. Really my, my core identity is my identity as a child of God. And sometimes I've just got to just go sit on the porch and just clear my head and just forget about all the ways that I feel like I'm failing or the way I'm seeing myself and just pray, you know, ask God to help me see myself through his eyes and just remember how loved I am, even on my worst day. And, um, and just, like I said, show myself some grace and know that I'm doing my best, even if the others, others don't see it, God knows it. And he's really the only one, his opinion really is the only one that matters, but He's going to work all things together for good and just really trusting in that. And also, like I said, you know, knowing that we can ask for forgiveness and do better next time. And I think it's so good for our children to see that, to not see us staying stuck in defeat, stuck in those feelings of things will never change because they've got to see us kind of fighting that good fight and saying, you know, things are not ideal, but I'm going to give myself credit. I'm proud of myself for doing this today. You know, I did this well today. And I'm going to work on this, but at the same time, I'm going to love myself and show myself some grace. Yeah. And then we can give that more to our, to our girls mm -hmm. and our boys. Um, I think what you're saying is so important to remember. And also that, that it's not good to try and do it all perfectly in front of our girls because it gives them permission to not be perfect either. Yes. And you have, in chapter two, you share 14 realities impacting today's teen girls. And I think in addition to not beating ourselves up, it's important to remember what's impacting our girls and the pressure that they're under. What are a couple of the realities that you can share that you write about? You don't have to share all 14, but are there a couple that stand out to you? 
that you list in, in the book. Yet I think it's just the pressure, the pressure to succeed, the pressure to impress, the pressure to be perfect. I think that's the most overwhelming thing that our girls feel. And you're so right. I think that as we admit our human humanity and our weaknesses and our mistakes, it just gives them permission to do the same. And they need that because if we think we're seeing a lot of perfection, at least in the mom world, we're kind of in that place. I feel like having written for teenage girls, it's just funny because you look at what they tell each other on Instagram. You're so perfect. I want to be you. You see how we, we wire ourselves to this perfectionist mindset. You think that's the goal is perfection. And then as moms, we're trying to unwire ourselves of that mindset. Like, no, no, you know, we, we can't be perfect on this side of heaven. That's just, we're doing the best we can. But um, it is so important to model to our girls because they see perfection all around them. They feel like failures when they're not measuring up. And I keep thinking of this, this girl who's, you know, the 17 year old girl, very cute, very successful by the world standards, but she was at this retreat with her parents and they were having this deep heart to heart talk. And she just broke down in tears to them. And she told her parents, you two are just so perfect. I feel like I can never measure up. Mm -hmm. And her parents were heartbroken. I mean, they are not, they were not trying to portray that image to her, but what they didn't realize by, was by not sharing any of their humanity and their humanness, they really were doing her disservice. They're just playing into that narrative. She was already hearing from the world. So, um, you know, I had a conversation about this with my husband's priest recently. He's a Greek Orthodox priest. And he talked about how he used to work in Greece. He was a priest there for 10 years. And he goes, you know, I was talking to my spiritual father there. And he said that, you know, America has this like obsession with superheroes more so than any other culture. And we kind of see ourselves as superhumans and superheroes. And when we don't meet those standards, we just feel like failures. And, um, and he was reading a book called How to Be a Sinner. And I thought that was so interesting that just, you know, really realizing that maybe the problem is our culture and what people are telling us, you know, measures success or failure and just really redefining what success means for us. Um, I hate to say lowering standards because that's not a very popular thing to say, but just being okay with like, this is good enough for today. And just knowing our limits. I mean, I know myself, you know, I have author friends who they can put out a book a year. I mean, they can just whip it out. They can write a book in six oh, weeks. Yeah. And I'm so envious. I'm like, oh, you know, part of me wants to do that because I've got that driven side of me. But I'm like, for me to do that, I would have to get no sleep, <laughs> neglect my family. I would be moody and grumpy all the time. Like it just would not work for me, it would not make me a happy person. So I can't do that. I'm a slow writer. I, it might take me a couple of years to, to release a book, but that's just what works for me. And so I think it's really just knowing what works well for you. What do you want out of your life? And, you know, prioritizing the right things, not sacrificing your faith or your family or the things that matter most but yet doing the, the jobs that we're called to do and just giving ourselves grace as we do it. Mm -hmm. That comparison, uh, I know I'm working on a book right now and it's, it's taken me like three years. <laughs> it is, and the comparison thing, yeah. and our girls and social media, it's really tough because they're looking at all those pictures and comparing themselves and, and we can do that too. I, I know you weave yeah. in a lot of your own struggles with your girls. How have you done that where you've been able to kind of balance that talking about your own challenges with your daughters? Yes, I have. Um, because, you know, we live in a community and I think most people do now that there is a lot of um, success and excellence all around them. I've, I've always just, even as we're driving to school, just share stories about you know, from my childhood or my past or like, you know, one time I was a bad friend to somebody. I did this. Mom, you did that. I was like, I know I feel bad. I just remembered this the other day and I feel bad about it. I feel like I need to apologize to her. I didn't really realize it at 16. I see it differently through different eyes at 48, but I think it's just little conversations like that. Or, you know, today, you know, the other day I made some toast for my girls and one of them was like, mom, just please don't burn it. You know, and I was like, okay. <laughs> so I'm like, I burned toast and I, I wish I didn't. That's really embarrassing, but I just can laugh about it. Like that's just not one of my strengths being in the kitchen. And so it's just being able to laugh at ourselves and know that I've got some things I'm pretty good at, some things I'm not that good at. And you do too. And even one of my daughters, I, I was talking to her the other day because she struggles in a subject. And I saw this in an article somewhere. I was like, you know, the thing about school is, you know, school expects you to be great at every subject. And in real life, that's not really feasible. And in the workplace, that's not feasible. You don't have somebody doing everything in a job. You have people specializing at what they're good at. 
And so school doesn't really predict your success for many reasons, but that's one of them. You're not expected to be a superstar in seven different subjects. You can be really focused on your one or two or three strengths and do very well. And a lot of the, the intelligence out there and the talents out there can't be measured by school. You know, it can't measure things like creativity or empathy or kindness. And so um, just really helping our kids see that big picture because, you know, they're, set, they're growing up in this society where it's, you know, numbers driven and like you said, just success and perfection everywhere. And, um, and it's interesting, you talk to therapists and they talk about how like the troubled teenager looks so different now that it used to be, you could tell he was troubled. They had bad grades, they had unkept hair, you know, they, did, they looked the part. And now I think the biggest at-risk group of teenagers is like upper middle class, yeah. you know, privileged society. And I think it really flies under the radar because they look, they look so successful on paper. They look great. They seem happy on social media, yet inside they feel empty. They're struggling and they're not really building that inner self, that inner self that's really going to make them happy. That inner life, I guess, is what I mean to say, but they're not really developing and cultivating that part of them. And they don't know why they feel so empty because they should be happy with everything they have. And so that goes back to the relationship. That's why I think it's so important, even more so for our generation to have that relationship with our teenagers, maybe even more so than our parents with us, because they're struggling with a lot more. And, um, you know, things like suicide and depression and anxiety, it's a lot more of a reality now than it was 20 or 30 years ago. So the stakes are high if our teenagers are struggling, are feeling isolated, which most of them are, if they are feeling that and they don't feel like they can come talk to us about it. Oh, gosh, uh, that, what you said is so good. I think on so many levels, so many things. I mean, I love that you said that about the grades, because I'm seeing that a lot with the parents that I'm working with is, and especially with the pandemic, that's just mm. added a whole nother layer. Yes. That I think we set these expectations that are so high for our kids. And yet I, I never thought of it that way in the way that you said it with the grades. It's like, of course, like I was horrible at math. I mean, I was just, right. <laughs> I, I would never go into anything that had to do with numbers. In fact, I did have for a very short time a job where they had me do a spreadsheet and I, and I had to like calculate the sales. And I remember I brought it in and they had to call me into the office and they're like, what is this? <laughs> and I'm like, I have no idea. I mean, it was like the worst job for me to have. And uh, it's the same with our kids, like expecting them to have, putting all that pressure and I think we mean well, but I do see that because we live in an affluent area and there is so much focus on where they go to college and, mm -hmm. that, and it's so stressful for our kids. And then they get into this performance, uh, like I am less than if I'm not performing and I'm a, it's, it's just loaded. And mm -hmm. rather than you're talking about, wow, they have so much empathy and different strengths and cultivating those things. Um, what do you think about the expectations? I mean, you do talk about that in the book about how do we, how do we kind of curb that and still, you know, have some expectations, but not put so much pressure on our kids. Right. And, and it's hard. And, you know, and I know as a parent, it's a fine line because you just want your child. Our big thing is we just want to see you doing your best. And, you know, we, our kids study the table, you know, so one, had had some not so great grades recently and she was upset about it. And we're like, it's okay. We have seen how hard you're working. Like we, and that's, that's enough for us. And so, you know, I think some parents feel like they have to stay in their child more because maybe they're a little bit lazier or not so driven. So it is hard. Like how can you help them rise to their potential, but not just put so much stress on them. And, and I think that if one thing this year past year has taught us is just the importance of mental health yeah. and knowing that if our mental health is not there, whether we're a mom or a teenager, then nothing else is going to be there. And I've been wanting to do an article on this because it's really fascinating to me. But um, I know you live in Illinois, but you've probably heard of Coach Saban, Nick Saban at the University of Alabama. I mean, this amazing, legendary football coach. He's, I forget how many national championships we've won. He's won by this point. But um, a friend of mine, her daughter plays golf at Alabama. And she was telling me, this was before the pandemic, that mental health is like the number one priority for all the student athletes at the school. And it's because wow. of Nick Saban. And there's articles out there about it. It's pretty fascinating. But he, um, they realized that if the mental health of their players were not there, the physical ability wouldn't be there. 
And so they've even trained like their trainers. They kind of see them like there's almost like a bartender in a bar that you just kind of a pulse on what's going on. But they've trained their trainers to notice things like, is he wearing the same clothes several days in a row? Is he acting more withdrawn than normal? I think they have a psychologist that's kind of just around the area that the players see. And that way, if they need to talk to somebody, they're, they know the person, they're kind of comfortable talking to them. But they really prioritize mental health and getting that right because everything else follows from there. And I really think we can do that with our children is just helping them get to a good place mentally and knowing that if that's if that is intact, then they are going to have that sense of purpose and drive and, you know, self-worth that we want them to have too. Yeah, focusing on the relationship and the mental health piece. Mm-hmm. So important. And at this age, it's really easy with our daughters and having raised two girls. Um, you know, I certainly understand this. You talked about Um, in the book, your first chapter about really choosing our words. And it is easy to focus more for whatever reason on the negative at this age. And maybe it is because they're pulling away more and we feel that that's hurtful. And so we focus on it. I think you talk about the projecting onto our daughters. Mm -hmm. And I know I, I say I am a recovering image manager (laughs) <laughs> so it would be very easy for me to focus on like what they were wearing and, you know, and all of that stuff that really, it doesn't matter so much. And you even talked about when your daughter, you know, it's like her face was breaking out and you were like, no, don't mention that. Mm-hmm. You know, um, can you speak about a little bit about what you've learned through that kind of shifting your focus from the negative to more of the positive? Yes. I have learned that not every thought I have needs to be voiced, especially with a teenager. And I do think we get more, you know, it's easy to get more critical and and we don't see it as criticism. We see it as helping them become an an adult. You know, we're trying to help them become an adult. And I think what has happened with me is I realized as, you know, my kids became teenagers, especially as they hit their 16th birthday. I'm like, I got two more years. So it's like in our head as moms, you kind of start hearing that countdown clock, like, I got two more years to teach them all these things and to, you know, just remind them how to be a good guest at somebody's house, all these things. I think we can get so caught up in those lessons and correcting that we just forget to love them and encourage them. And we forget that they might not be hearing many positive words or much affirmation at school. Friendships are not necessarily what they used to be even. And so how important that is for them to be getting that from us. And it's funny, you mentioned that story about the, um, the breakout, because that's probably the number one story moms mentioned to me when they read that book, I think it really stands out to them and they, they feel it because they've done the same thing too. It's just something. Um, but that, that chapter is the first chapter about choosing your words and the timing of your words very carefully. And it really just goes back to the fact that our, our words as mothers have superpowers. You know, we, we don't forget even, you know, we don't forget what our moms have said to us for better or for worse. And our daughters are going to remember too. And I don't want to make that anybody feel bad because like I said, we can always apologize, do better. And this is a long-term relationship and any long-term relationship, we're all going to make mistakes. That's just how it is, especially with family, but we can, you know, keep trying to find ways to do better. But in this situation, my daughter and I, um, she'd had a few different breakouts and, um, and her face was breaking out again, but I didn't notice it at first. We were driving in the car, having a great conversation. Didn't even feel like her mom. She felt like my friend, you know, like we were just singing and laughing and having a great time. Just one of those moments that you really pray for as a mom. And when we stopped in the driveway, I looked over at her and her, her face, her acne, like the sun was glaring on her face and her acne was kind of back. And my instinct as a mom was to ask her, are you taking your medicine? But I know my child, I know she's very responsible. I know she wants her, she wanted her acne to go away even more than I was concerned about it. And I knew that when I asked her that same question a few months before her face just fell and she said, yes, I am. I know my face looks terrible. And so I remember that. I think God just called that to mind. And so I just bit my tongue. And I'm like, I know she's taking her medicine. And if I say this now, I'm totally going to ruin the moment we just had. So I want to end on a happy note. And so she got out of the car happy. It was a great conversation. And I was so thankful that I didn't waste that moment by saying something that really didn't need to be said at that time. Maybe another time, but and maybe in another way, but I didn't have to say it. And I think that's just an example. There are so many things we can do as moms that we don't have to say every thought when it comes to mind, we can really just pray about it first and be wise with our words. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. You have a quote 
William Barclay in the book, if we find ourselves becoming critical of other people, we should stop examining them and start examining ourselves. And I thought that was so true. And with the daughters, especially, it's easy to put ourselves on them. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that with yourself, uh, with your daughters, that that's been a challenge for you? What would you say to the moms that that um, struggle with that? Because I know I certainly have, and I do think we have to keep bringing it back to yeah. ourselves. Yes, I think I think especially as you're when you're early in that journey, I think as you get further into it, like you and I are now, you realize the things you did wrong. And, but I think the natural inclination, and I, I read this during research, is that moms tend to see their daughters as perfected versions of themselves. Oh. And so really, I thought that was pretty powerful. I'm like, ooh, I have been guilty of that because I am a perfectionist, and I have been guilty of trying to make them better than me, a perfected version of me, and that's why I want to fix all these things. And then to really realize that it's not my job to fix them. You know, I am guiding and loving and advising, but you know, there's a saying to connect before you correct. And, mm -hmm. you know, teenagers are like anybody else. And the thing about our kids as they get older, they can choose whether or not they want to listen to us. When they're little, they think we hung the moon. And so they, they listen to every word we say. As teenagers, they have a choice. They have a lot of other voices in their life. And so if we want to be somebody that they listen to, they've got to feel like we love them. They've got to feel like we see the best in them. Even when they mess up, there's a way to do it. Like, I am so disappointed. This is so out of character for you. You know, you're going to face some consequences, but this is not you. This is not who you are. I know you, I've raised you, that you are better than this. We're going to get through this. And, you know, I want you to write them an apology or, you know, walking with them through their mistakes and the things that they maybe need to work on but giving them hope and reminding them of who they are and really just showing them that big picture of their potential and how loved they still are. And, um, and just really remembering mercy, you know, as, and I really think that's what it means to become a grown up is to really be that person for our children as they grow up, that they're going to mess up. But if we still love them through their mess ups, they're going to listen to us. They're going to take our advice and our words to heart. Whereas if we just come down like a hammer, just do it this way or you're out, then they're, they're not going to want to come home. They're going to have a choice of whether they listen to us. And, and that's really the challenge for us as parents is so I think that's why such a connection is so important so that we can have that voice in their life. Yeah, really powerful stuff. It's like you're on their side, you're for them mm -hmm. so that they know that and, and that humility that as moms, we mess up. Our girls are learning, they're growing. Of course, they don't know how to navigate all of these things at this age. They're learning and they're gonna mess up and they're gonna make mistakes and, and not always make the best choices. And rather than coming in with that shaming voice, which we end up carrying into mm -hmm. our adulthood, and I know we all have them, those different voices, but how can we give our daughters those more loving, compassionate voices, even when they mess up. Mm -hmm. And your, your book is very powerful in the way that you walk, walk us through that. And I really appreciate your words so much. Uh, you talk about enjoying your daughter shouldn't be complicated. Um, <laughs> there are some great ideas because I think we do make it complicated and you share some simple things. Right. Uh, what, what are a few, I just give them a few of your ideas. I was like, these are really good. You know, I, it is the simple things. And I think it really goes back to knowing your child. I was laughing as I was writing that list because we had a lot of food on there. Like, you know, get them a acai bowl or um, yogurt. And, and my editor's like, maybe put in some other ones, but that's my kid's love language is food. And so that's always, I mean, like, you know, you know, I have a a friend, you know, she said her daughter, you know, she loves Greek salads. And so when she came home from cheer trouts, you know, she knew she'd be stressed and exhausted. So her mom had a Greek salad waiting for her. And so it's just those little things. I think just saying if you want to go on a walk, especially if they're kind of stressed or, you know, they just, you just need to get outside and move, just inviting them to go on a walk. Um, knowing, you know, my daughter, we somehow got into watching Downton Abbey. She's the daughter about to graduate. Her friend was watching it with her mom and she's like, Hey mom, do you want to watch this with me? I had some other things going on that night, but of course I'm like, yes, I will drop everything to come watch it with you. So that's kind of become our thing at night when we have a little, an hour here or there, we'll go watch an episode of Downton Abbey. And so just to know that it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It doesn't have to require planning or a lot of time. 
to just find these ways to connect with our daughters, just but seeing things that they like to do. And it might be doing something kind of fun, like here in Birmingham, you know, we've talked about doing this as a family is going to, there's this axe throwing place. You go and throw these axes. Oh, I've heard about that. And the teenagers love it. And so I'm like, I've never done that. That might be kind of something fun to do with them. Um, we also have a, a class here. It's a, it's a studio called 315 that a lot of the teenagers love. My daughter's friends work there and it's, it's you know, it's, um, bike uh, cycling and also some bar and some other things too and so I've started doing these classes with my daughter on Saturday morning which I love it but mostly I just love being with her and we'll go to get breakfast after that so it's just really you know trying to find something that your daughter enjoys that you can do with her or that you know if you're offering to pay for something you know when you, you need to go look for some earrings for homecoming you know they're always up for something like that but it really is less complicated than we think. And I, and I do believe they want to spend time with us more than we realize, but sometimes it does have to be on their terms. Mm -hmm. And going back to the walking story, I have this in the book. My friend is a single mom. She asked her daughter, they were kind of disconnected. She, she'd read some of my suggestions on uh, Facebook once and she asked her daughter that afternoon, do you want to go walking when she got home from school? And her daughter's like, no mom, I'm kind of tired. So she was a little hurt, but try not to take it personally. Two days later, her daughter came to her and said, mom, do you want to go walking today? And she was exhausted from work. She really didn't feel like going, but she knew that invitation might not come again. So they went walking and she said they had the best conversation and they agreed to go walking again and just how helpful and therapeutic it was. So I think it's just those little things that can really mean a lot and stay with our teenagers even longer than we think. Yeah, and still, even if they turn you down, still inviting them to do things mm -hmm. and not giving up. Yes. Yeah. And I love the story that you shared about just the cookies where you had baked yes. cookies and your daughter was like, mom, are those cookies for me? <laughs> and, and, or something like that. Yes. You were like, yes, you know, I, I, it was like you apologized, I think, and you had made her cookies. And even that, I mean, that just spoke, I thought, oh, that mm -hmm. just spoke so much love to her that you were thinking about her that, you know, and I don't think we think of just those little things. Like I used to get my, my son these, he loved those um, red fish, mm -hmm. you know, they're like those jelly kind of red fish that they share. And he loved that. And I would just even buy the red fish for him. Like just little things that convey, I'm thinking of you. I love you. You matter to me. Right. I think we all, we just like to feel known. I mean, it, it's kind of like, you know, there's certain people who are just good gift givers. You know, if you've ever had a birthday and somebody gave you a gift that's so unique and so you, you know, like those are always your favorite gifts. Like, wow, that is, they know me. They, they remembered that they saw this in a store and thought of me. I think that's, we all long to feel that way because it, it's a form of love. And, you know, who to better know this about our children than us as moms, because we've raised them and we, we know these little details about them that other people might not know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just two more questions, because I know we could talk for so long, but I really want the moms to get your book to get because there's so much more we could talk about. Mm -hmm. um, one of the problems that moms are talking to me, especially right now, is and with the pandemic and coming out of that. And now our kids are they've been on their phones more than ever. Yes. And and now we're starting to come out of it. What have been some of the technology rules that you've laid down? Because it has been our kids' mental health, they've needed to feel connected. But I know moms feel hurt when their daughters have the door closed and they're on their phone 24 seven. How have you balanced that with your girls? Right, you know, just really talking about it. You know, I have one that she used to not be into her technology that much. And then probably in the last year has gotten a lot more into it. And it's a lot of, you know, Snapchatting with her friends, but, um, but I'll kind of say sometimes like, you know, you've been on your phone, you know, maybe put your phone down for a while. I feel like you've been on it a lot lately. We had another one. Um, my husband suggested this and one of our daughters took him up on it, that she was on her phone a lot. And we just got through with Lent right before Easter, the Lenten season. And a lot of times we'll sacrifice something we enjoy just in to try to turn it into some reflection of faith. 
And, um, and she agreed to just use, limit her screen time a day to two hours a day, which was big for her. Wow. But, you know, the great thing about that is just once they do that and they realize how much time it frees up and how much better they feel, that it really, it, it's a good lesson for them too. And I think something, you know, it might be as moms, we can like, you know, take the, let's all put our phones down for the day or for the weekend, or we'll go on a walk or a hike and not check technology. But I think our, our teenagers do need that to remember what it feels like with it and without it. And I have, um, I have a friend who owns a summer camp and they talk about how they hear that all the time at camp that these girls are so relieved to be away from their phones oh. and they can't wait to have these friendships where technology is not even around where they can just enjoy each other the old fashioned way. But I think sometimes technology is such a part of their life that they don't realize what they're missing if they're always on technology. And so to really see these breaks as you know, those opportunities to really learn those lessons. And you know, I mine have seen that too when they've had retreats or something where they couldn't have their phone. I remember after the second one they went to, they were going to the next one. And my daughter and her friends were like, I can't wait to be without my phone all weekend. And I was like, I never thought I'd hear that. But just they realized how much better they felt without it. Um, so it's different for every family, but just as moms, you know, just really don't be scared to, to say something or to, to put limits. And it's harder with older children, especially like mine that are, you know, you're about to go to college. They'll be able to, they'll be able to be on it as much as they want. So it's really about like, you got to want this for yourself. Like I'm trying to teach you healthy habits. And so really for your mental health, um, to just try to limit your screen time. Also talk about how, you know, try not to be on it an hour before you go to bed because it can interfere with your sleep, that blue light from the phone can keep you producing from producing the melatonin in your brain that makes you sleepy. So um, I think just having a lot of those conversations and explaining why, why it's good to limit technology. And also I found that this works to sometimes as even using examples of myself, like, y'all, I've been so media or grumpy lately or dissatisfied with my life. And I realize I've been on social media more than I need to be. I'm comparing myself. And so sometimes as we, as we share some realizations we've had, it might lead them to self-reflect too and realize that they kind of feel the same way. Yeah, I love that. I think doing that can be really helpful. My daughter was on a retreat and couldn't have her phone. And she said, wow, I tasted my food. Like my food tasted really good. Oh, like, wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. I know. Yes. That was, you know, and I was noticing everything. And I think even talking about that, like when we are off of it, how do you, how do you notice you feel? Right. And, and getting our girls to kind of connect with that. Yeah, I feel, I do notice, I feel a little bit better, you know, just being, mm -hmm. uh, look around, you know, rather than down all the time and how we can feel better as well when we're off of our devices. Uh, last word. So for the mom that's, that's listening and she's struggling with her daughter right now and just doesn't know how to connect what would you want to say to her to give her some comfort and that can help right first thing I'd want her to know that she's not alone that it is very normal especially in the teenage years and I'm not saying everybody goes through that but it's very normal and it's because that our teenagers are, they're growing up They're I mean, it's really part of the natural process of them forming their own identity, an identity apart from us, an identity part, apart from our family. And so we have to give them the space to do that. But, um, but really just know that you, she does still want your engagement in her life, whether she acts like it or not. Mm -hmm. And it's to really find those ways to do it. And um, my sissy golf, my friend, Sissy Golf, who works with teen girls, she talks about the, the posture to take with teenagers is breezy, you know, just, okay. You know, sometimes we, if we care more, if we care more about something than they care, then they're not going to care anymore. So even like if somebody buys my book for their teenage daughters, and I've always said this too, that like, I'm trying to get her to read it, but she doesn't like to read. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't want to read a book right now. So I'm like, don't force it. If you force it, she's not going to read it. Just put it on her bedside table. And that way, one day when she's having a hard time, she might pick it up and open it and be like, huh, this book that my mom bought me is actually pretty helpful, but you're not forcing it on her. So I think just to find those subtle ways to kind of be engaged in their life and, you know, say they want to spend some time in their room, but you know, you know that she loves avocado toast. So, okay, just kind of bring up some avocado toast. Say, hey, just, I'm thinking about you and just drop it off. And those, it's just those little gestures that I think kind of slowly bring them out of their shell. You're really just trying to build that bridge that, you know, that bridge they're, they're moving away from us. We want that bridge where they can come back anytime. 
and, and just know, don't, don't devalue your role in her life or your place in her life. And um, every long-term relationship goes through ups and downs and different seasons and dry seasons and great seasons. So really just hang in there and get yourself in a strong position so you can just turn around and offer that strength and that love to her. Yeah, I love that. I love thinking of it for all our listeners, all our moms, breezy. Yes. Than, you know, we tend to like, like, love me, oh, please love me. Yes, or so tight or take everything so seriously, you know, just like breezy, you know, there's a lightness and a love and a, a more of a trust, right? Having that mm-hmm. faith that when we can love them and invest in them and get that support for ourselves, uh, it can be so helpful in bridging that gap. Like you say, right. oh. yes, and that's okay. just being their cheerleaders. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, Carrie, this has been so helpful, and I'm excited to have you back on when your new book comes out. Thank you, Cheryl. Have you picked a? Can you have you picked a title yet? We are working on that right now, but they have upped the release date to next April, so it'll come out right before Mother's Day. So it's for moms. Wow, perfect. Well, tell our listeners where they can find you and find your book um, and also your podcast. I really was struck by your podcast. Uh, I think it's a helpful podcast for moms to be able to listen to with their daughters if their daughters are open to that. And they're short and you share such good nuggets. I thought, oh, that would be a nice podcast to listen to with your, your girl. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, um, I'm on all the traditional outlets, the um, Instagram, Facebook, it's Carrie Campakis Writer, and then the, the podcast, which I kind of let go for a while as I was writing my book, but I'm getting back into it now. And it's called The Girl Mom Podcast. And then um, my books can be found on Amazon and anywhere books are sold. Wonderful. And I'll provide those links. Perfect. Yeah. So they can find those links very easily. Well, thank you. Thank you for all of your words and wisdom and everything that you're doing to support girls and moms with daughters. Well, thank you for the work that you're doing. I love this conversation and I loved how our work connected us and brought us together. So thank you for letting me share a word with your listeners. Yeah.